I'm Q Jackson, lifestyle editor of the Quintessential Gentleman magazine, and I'm excited because we got one of the actors from a couple of my favorite shows, actually, most recently, Abbott Elementary, Tyler James Williams. How are you, my guy? I'm very good, very good. It's a pleasure to talk to you, finally. Absolutely, absolutely. So you guys are in season one of Abbott Elementary. Um, you guys are still on the air. People are loving what you guys are doing. How does that feel? Uh, it's incredible, man. I mean, this is um, one of the first times I've been able to, you know, I've been blessed to have a few hits in my life. And this is the first time I've been able to have one and watch it happen in real time. Um, social media has only just now grown to what it is. Um, so it's a very unique experience. It's one that, you know, will for sure never, ever forget. Um, but it's a blessing. Absolutely. And you're right. When Everybody Hates Chris first started, Mm -hmm. What did they have? I think it was MySpace or something like that, I believe. Even, I mean, I don't think even when it started, MySpace was a thing. I think in the middle of it, it became a thing. And it definitely didn't have communities of people rallying behind things the way Twitter works or the way Instagram works, for example. Um, so it's the industry has evolved. The fans have evolved in their watching patterns. Um, and it's, you know, it's just good to still to still be here as, as they continue to evolve. Absolutely. You're celebrating almost 20 years right in the in the industry well yeah i've been i've been working since i was four so it's about 20 almost 26 years at this point yeah wow you're almost celebrating three decades wow. yeah so first of all congratulations thank um, you second of all how does that feel to go from what was considered to be a child star mm -hmm. now you're a whole just adult star mm -hmm. out here in the street how does that feel uh, it's wild, man. It really is. It's It's been first and foremost a blessing. I think, you know, I, I was just talking to somebody else about it. It's like, I've seen so many people come and go. And like, it's so hard to maintain the longevity. Um, that's, you know, I think people can can get hits here and there, but like to still be here all of this time is, is really what's, what's hard. I think when we look at people and we talk about giving them their flowers and all of that, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, they've been able to hang in here for such a long time. So it's, it's a beautiful thing for me, man, to see audiences when they were kids watching me, you know, as we were all kids, really, I guess, as we all of us were children. And then yes. now we're all, you know, in our th early 30s or turning 30 and we're still here. We're still vibing with each other. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about my career is hopefully I can be with y'all through every step of your life and mine as well. And we just keep, you know, telling our stories as we grow. Absolutely. So um, representation. Mm -hmm. As you know, you know, the quintessential gentleman, our culture issue is coming out and representation right. is a major thing. So mm -hmm. for you as an actor, for you as a black man in America, what does representation mean to you? Representation to me, um, I know there's like many definitions of it at this point. Um, and I, you know, I'm not into representation just for representation's sake. Um, I look for <clears throat> the underrepresented communities or people whose voices are not spoken for. Um, so even now, as we get into this more nuanced conversation about representation, um, particularly for Black men, I'm looking at, you know, things, the, the, the pieces that fall through the gaps. You know what I mean? I think we've done a really good job of getting Black people and particularly Black men back into the conversation. Like it was, you know, someone in the 90s, we all of a sudden forgot that we needed that. And we needed that on our television screens. Um, but now I'm into validating the the uh, black male experience emotionally um, and vulnerably. I think there's there's still an underrepresentation of showing black men's full emotional spectrum and us kind of feeling all of the things and being able to reside in in multiple places and what that code switching looks like for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that to me is what's important for me in my career right now. Okay. Now, speaking of the Black man and being represented, so you play a substitute teacher who was pretty much snubbed on the job for principal. Um, right. And, you know, you're in there, you're making your impact. Like, how much of this role do you feel is actually you? Now, before you answer that, now please tell me, what, what did Charlie Ralph say? The, the Nissan sandwich, the little bull chip sandwich. <laughs> Please tell me that's how <laughs> I can put it. I can put you to rest. I have a very wide and broad palette. 
I like all types of foods. Okay. I'm, I'm culinarily um, experienced <laughs> and I enjoy things. That's not, that's not me. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's weird. It feels like this is an appropriate question for actually Quinta Brunson. Uh, Quinta's known me for a while and there's been aspects of Gregory that she's written in that I didn't necessarily immediately resonate with, but over time while we shot it, she helped me realize how much of me was in it. So mm. Gregory, in a lot of ways, emotionally, um, in his journey, ends up being a character study on myself that I didn't even know I was doing. Um, and that's because, and Quinta says it over and over again, I know you better than you know yourself sometimes. And I'm like, you really do, you do. Because there's certain things I'm like, can we really pull that off? And it does. Um, you know, I think a great example of that is uh, that scene we had that's now kind of gone viral of Gregory dancing for the first time. Mm -hmm. um it was a she you know kind of seen these moments of me where I'm usually typically pretty reserved fairly introverted I think people see my work and they think I'm something other than what I actually am in my day-to-day -day. um but when I choose to and I choose to connect with people um I can really break outside of that shell and go beyond myself and that scene is really a beautiful example of that um, to the point where I remember when I read it, we talked about it extensively and I was like, I don't know, it's just, it feels interesting. It's going to be hard to pull off to make these, because that episode is a lot of like pivots and turns for Gregory. Mm. Um, but again, it pulled off because she understood it and knew it. So I think initially I would say um, me and Gregory are similar, but, you know, fairly different people, but I'm still, you know, not sure about that. That's the brilliant thing about having a really close friend of yours be the writer yeah. of the show. <laughs> and I was just about to ask that, like, now we know that every role, role that you get, sometimes you won't get the chance to work with people that you right. knew prior to coming on set. So for you, how important or how comfortable does that make you to have somebody that, you know, is very familiar with you? And do you get nervous now seeing that some of that character that you're playing is actually a little bit of you and we're seeing that? Um, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, well, one, this is ideal, right? It never, it very rarely works out that you get to work with friends and it's mm -hmm. good. Usually you get to work with friends and then it's like, eh, <laughs> or it's great and it's just nobody that you know or really you know, like in that way. Um, so this one actually worked out really well. Usually I would be nervous. Um, you know, I, I don't find myself particularly interesting. Um, I find the characters I play really interesting. I consider mm -hmm. myself fairly boring. Um, but in this sense, it's somebody who knows me very well. Um, and Quinta knows me very, very well, oftentimes to a scary extent. Um, <laughs> so with that, I can trust her. You know, I can sit there and, you know, when she sits down with her pen to write things out, I know that she has not only the character's best interest at heart, but mine as well. Um, and that makes this a very unique experience. And I know she does that with all of the characters and all of the actors. Um, and it's, it's, it's really nice to have that comfort of knowing that your showrunner and writer has your best interest at heart and is inspired by you and wanting to tell parts of your story that people may not have seen in an interesting way um, without having to be concerned about being too exposed mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Now, being a teacher, playing a teacher, mm -hmm. um, was there any inspiration that you had growing up with? mom a teacher dad that auntie mm -hmm. around the corner was anybody a teacher that you kind of pulled from for this role that's what was actually really sad when prepping it is i didn't have anything to pull from mm -hmm. and that's why when she brought it to me i was like oh this is really important to do because i didn't even realize i had no black male educators in my history growing up i just didn't have any it never came up I never even knew to have it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I didn't even realize it until doing this. Um, so when building Gregory out, he became an amalgamation of really everything I wanted. Everything I was like, what, what, if I, if this were to be the case and there was somebody to step into my life at you know this time in my life, what would I have wanted him to be like? Mm -hmm. And that's who Gregory has become. Um, but no, I had, you know, there's aspects of it that's my father, there's aspects of him that are uncles, there's aspects of him who are directors who, you know, kind of nurtured me over time, but none of which came into my educational um, life and in and, and, and the school system. Um, and that's what makes him really important to me. Okay. Now, piggybacking off of something you said about not having 
any of those black male influences as teachers growing up. Mm -hmm. So according to the Stanford Graduate School of Education, only 2% of America's teachers are black men. 2%. That would make, that would make sense. Yes. I missed that 2%. Yeah. <laughs> so for you, why is it important to have more black men in these fundamental spaces for our black children? That's later, later. So several reasons. One, as young black kids, we need to see black men be a part of the nurturing and rearing of the next generation actively. Mm -hmm. I think there's been this narrative that we have not been able to control that black men are inept at that or are not a part of that process. And there are black men every day struggling to provide and be in the lives of their kids and all of that. And I think another way we can do that is to show them in the educational system. Um, I think that 2% is tragic. It's not that we don't have anything to contribute. You know what I mean? It's not like we're not needed. We absolutely are. And I think that leads into the next point, which is it's not romanticized. I think we, we oftentimes romanticize for black men things that are very monetarily um, beneficial or very um, high profile, mm -hmm. but we don't reinforce, validate, and uplift those who are doing the hard work that's not necessarily going to make you a lot of money, mm -hmm. that is doing it because you were called to it. But I think you know it takes a village to raise a child, and if we do not have Black men as part of that village, then what does that say for the young Black boys who are growing up not seeing Black men do that? We know that's where the representation of it all comes in. We can see something, we can do it. We have to understand that black men need to have role models for raising and rearing children. And if we're not doing that in the educational system, we're using the educational system as an example to show kids all types of things, right? They learn mm -hmm. all things really fast, yet we don't have anybody for young black men and young black women to see black men in that way. And that affects the future of how they view each other. Um, so that's, that's, what's really important to me with this is hopefully I'm, you know, 10 years ago when we did everybody hates Chris, we were just, we were doing it and we were trying to make really good programming, um, and tell the story of, you know, black families and the nuclear black family and a mother and a father and how that mm. worked in the eighties and how then years later, I had a bunch of people saying, you were my childhood. You know what I mean? I learned all these things from you. And because of this, I went on to do this, this, and the third. If 10 years from now, I can have a bunch of Black men approaching me saying, I became a Black teacher, a mm -hmm. Black male educator in all different forms of education because I saw Gregory Eddy and I resonated with him and wanted to be like him, then I'm doing more than making programming. And that's the purpose of why I'm here. So... The roles that you play, mm -hmm. most of the roles that you've played are like the, people connect with them. They are right. so spot on. Like I'd look at everybody hates Chris. And, you know, I kind of think like mm, it's kind of like the modern version in a way of good times. They just got a right. little more money, you know, mm -hmm. my father was <laughs> slightly more. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> you know, my father was definitely the father in there. Mm -hmm. I felt like I'm more so connected with you. I had a brother. I had a sister. Mm -hmm. You know, a mother who, not like Rochelle, but, you know, she was she a virgin. A virgin. <laughs> and then, you know, we have shows now like Abbott Elementary, who, you know, it once again, it reflects what we mm -hmm. are experiencing in our communities. How important is that part to you? Picking a role, choosing a role, and embodying a role that somebody out there can connect with. And, you know, 20 years later, we can look back at Everybody Hates Chris. And mm -hmm. 20 years from now, we can look back at Abbott Elementary, Elementary, sorry. And these are still roles that people can connect with. How important is that to you? That's my purpose. That's why I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I, I, especially after Everybody Hates Chris, I had multiple opportunities to do a bunch of I mean, no better word for it than just bullshit. You know what I mean? Just yeah. stuff that would just pay a lot and I'd make a lot of money and I could do the same role over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I would just make a bunch of money and that's about it. It would be about me. And I, I just can't, I can't do that. It doesn't resonate with me. I think a lot of people, you know, particularly in internet conversations have asked, you know, why have I not been doing more? And it's because there's not enough 
of purpose work for me. Um, for me, I'm not here to be the prettiest thing. I'm not here to be, you know, even necessarily the funniest thing. I'm here to represent you. I'm that dude from down the block. I'm that dude you met at church. I'm that, you know, boy who's working at the corner store who's doing a really good job. I'm your brother. I'm your cousin. I'm that boyfriend you had one time. I'm eventually your husband. I'm somebody you fall in love with. I'm, I need to represent real Black people. And it, I think we get into this world where we have these like, hyper pretty hyper it's really like even the way you know people see people living there was something about good times and even with everybody hates chris of like yeah they were struggling but that was the point mm -hmm. because people relate more to struggle than they do with super success because the majority of the population is not super successful in that way we need to show them that their lives are romantic and pretty and worth living and there's beauty in them and that for me is what i'm here to do I, 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 thankfully i had a lot of success really early so i'm not chasing hits anymore mm -hmm. um but uh, i reside in a place you know ideally where that is the conversation where people who look like me who have stereotypically black features from a black family with yeah. black love <laughs> it's like that's that's what i'm here to do i'm not here to make it or repaint it or make it what hollywood wants to make it i'm going to keep it exactly what it is and show that that's beautiful yes yes i love it and you know like most people feel you know like you said earlier it's about the number of roles you get it's not mm -hmm. about the quantity it's about the quality and you've definitely been putting out that quality work. And over Thank the last you. couple of weeks, um, Abbott Elementary is not just something we see on Tuesday nights on mm -hmm. ABC, or if you don't catch it then, on Hulu, Hulu you know, the yeah. next day or whatever. It's not just that. Um, it's like Abbott Elementary has taken on a um, an identity of its own. You know, you guys have been on national television doing things across the country for students and things like that. Um, did you ever feel that even in your conversations with Quinta prior to the show, Aaron, that Abbott Elementary would be as big as it was and that you guys would be doing so much for the actual community um, like you guys are doing now? Um, yes and no. So when we shot the pilot, I've, I've always been able, I prided myself on being able to identify talent that's about to pop that people can't see. Mm -hmm. um, the, Hollywood has this thing where they, they decide to sometimes pick somebody and they're just like, mm -hmm. oh, this person's gonna be it, yeah. but then it never works. Like they try yeah. to shove them down your throat. Yeah. It just <laughs> doesn't work out. Um, and I don't know why they keep doing that because it just, it doesn't work. Um, I, I had it before with, you know, it's, you're now seeing with Coco Jones and Trevor Jackson when we did Let It Shine. I had it with Justin Simeon and Lena Waithe when we did Dear White People. And same thing with Quinta Brunson. I was like, yeah, I don't know, but this is about, she's about to be a force to be reckoned with. And, you know, not to use these street terms, but the price of the brick is about to go up. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> y'all don't understand. She's, she's doing all types of stuff right now. And that's, I remember we shot the pilot and I looked at Cheryl Lee Ralph and she is the only person I could look to because I know she's had as many hits as I have. But I was like, you feel that? And yeah. she was like, I do. And I was like, I think we have one here. Um, so in that way, I, I, I could feel it. I could feel that it was coming and it was time and it's about identifying talent and people who have a purpose and what they want to do. Quinta is that, you know, I, I love the work that she does and I love where her heart is. And that goes into the no of the answer, which is all the stuff that you see us doing is Quinta led. That's her, that's her deciding to divert our publicity budget from press to teachers. You know, wow. there was this really interesting conversation that we had once we were watching the numbers come in the first week and the second week and the third week and they were holding. And, you know, I've been through this process before. So we would talk, what does this mean? And I was like, I see a trend here. It seems to hold. I'm calling it a hit at three, at episode three. And I saw her pivot and go, if that's the case, and if the internet is doing its job and they're supporting the show and keeping it alive, then why are we spending all of this money <laughs> to keep it alive in people's mind that they're already doing this, this money could be used in a better way. And that's what perpetually surprises me about her um, and why I'm incredibly enamored by her sense of staying on track 
I've seen a lot of people get a hit and then they become whole new people, like literally in like weeks. And she stays on purpose with who she is. And there's certain people who should be famous. And I think Quinta Brunson is one of those people because of that moment and being able to see, we could put up a billboard in every city, everywhere. We could take our ad time literally all over the place, Mm -hmm. or we can pump this money back into the thing that we're talking about. And that's, that's the beautiful choice. Wow. See, I never thought about it like that. I never knew, you know, that that was going on, but to understand that it makes me respect what you guys are doing a lot more. Quinta Brunson, shout out to my showrunner. You know, she's the realest showrunner I've ever had. Yeah. And so now I have to add her because the question was going to be working with such strong black women, such as Shirley Ralph, AKA Moesha's stepmother, (laughs) working with um, Tashina Arnold, AKA Mm -hmm. Pam, you know, which is Mm -hmm. where everybody knows uh, these ladies from, as well as uh, Viola Davis, you know, what did you learn? But now we're adding Quinta Brunson into the the mix. So, you know, behind (laughs) every strong black man is a strong black woman. And you've worked with some of our cultures you know, most amazing actresses and Mm -hmm. writers, directors, producers, adding, you know, Quinta in, you know, how does that feel? And what do you feel like you've learned from these ladies since you've had the opportunity to work with them? As a man and as an actor, ha-ha. Both. Yes. I think my career, I started noticing a pattern and a shape and a trend at one point um, of turning that, phrase and inverting it I think for the longest it was behind you know every strong black man is a strong black woman but my career has now shaped into being behind every strong black woman is a strong black man that's where I follow I'm just like where <laughs> where and it's like you know I, I realize the place I'd love to reside is it, you know I, I can bring a lot of strength to a project because of the work that I've done previously um, and the notoriety I've had there if I can use that strength and muscle to help amplify voices of black women who, and just support them generally in that process, then it's ideal for me. Um, I had it with Andra Day with the US versus Billie Holiday of just like, I'll follow her in the battle anywhere. That, that's, that's, it, it was, it felt so on purpose for me and it's so fulfilling. Same thing with Quinta. I learned so many things comedically from Tashina. Tashina was a comedic mother for me in a lot of ways, where she people don't know. There's a lot of scenes in Everybody Hates Chris where you'll see I'm still learning how to not break character. Yeah. And that's because Tashina was actively attempting to break me. <laughs> like, actively, she was saying, I'm going to keep doing this so that you can go on any set, anywhere with anybody who's funny and be able to hold. And people don't understand how valuable that is. And that's her literally taking a mothering position. Um, and from that, I learned that all Black women need is somebody to stand behind them and say, I got you. Mm. That's it. I got you. Regardless, we'll go, we can go stand in front of whatever it is. We can go to any industry party meeting. We can put out a show. As long as they feel like I'm standing behind you and I got you, what do you need? They can run. And I think hopefully my career as an actor I found more fulfillment in being a supporting actor in that way. I'll be a supporting actor any day if I'm supporting a black woman who knows what she's doing. Yeah. Absolutely. That's I'll <laughs> yeah, take it. Yeah. I, I don't have to, it's not a it's not a thought for me because that's what we need. Um, and I think we need more of it, especially from a representation point of view. But it definitely grows me as an actor and it grows me as a person, fulfilling-wise. You know, I feel so much more fulfilled now being able to watch my sisters and people who look like me and my cousins and my mom be able to thrive and stand there. And I'm, I'm so cl- watching Quinta thrive and being so close mm-hmm. to watching it up front has been so fulfilling to me. This show is great. It's huge. I've gone through this fanfare before. I know what this feels like. I know what it is to watch her step into the spotlight and I can be right there. I have a front row seat to that. That's one of the most fulfilling things in the world. So people see Cheryl Lee Ralph and see she has been here. When you talk about longevity, from theater to the multicam sitcom to the single cam sitcom to a mon- like mockumentary style show to dramas, Cheryl can do everything. She is versatile. She is flexible. And people need to understand that. 
to see people clap for her now with that as a front row ticket, it's amazing. Janelle James is one of the funniest women on TV. And I'm going to say that. I, hands down, one of the funniest women on TV right now. Gil, tell me who else is funnier than her. Put them next to each other. And I don't know who's taking it. Um, to see her have that moment and to have a front row ticket has been incredibly fulfilling as well. I, I realize that I, I can not only work and do good work and make good money, but I can also feel fulfilled. And I think yeah. that's behind Black women. Yeah, see, I, I love it. Now, um, Everybody Hates Chris, is, is there ever going to be a reunion? I mean, we don't, we, we may not need a, spe- I mean, we don't need anything, but just something for, you know. I know, I know. It's, it's, it's come up quite a bit. Um, and it, it's something that like, it's so weird. It, it, it comes up in conversation and we talk about it and then something will happen and it'll die down and it'll come back up again. And then yeah. something will happen and it'll die down. Um, I think eventually we will. I think eventually we will. I think we're all, you know, fairly busy right now. Um, but I, I understand the culture's need for it. Yeah. Um, I think for us, you know, it's we feel accomplished in what we did. We closed the chapter. We knew it was the end. We knew that we had done something that was going to be appreciated for years and watching that be appreciated for years is fulfilling for us. But I know that the culture definitely uh, would like to see it. So I think at some point, at some point, we'll all figure it out. We just have to get it scheduling wise. But thankfully, we're all pretty busy, yeah. which for a fully black cast of actors is rare. Yeah. Okay. Now I know this is kind of off topic, but okay. every time my friends and I, I've seen people talk about it before. Um, every time they see you on screen, they view you as the tallest person <laughs> on the <laughs> screen. And I had to do some research. I'm like, how tall is this man? Because um, he looks at least six three, six four. <laughs> but the truth is, you are I'm five nine. Five nine. Five nine. Yeah, wow. Have you nine. gotten that before, though? Um, yes. So I've been told several times I have really big energy. <laughs> okay. I got, and I think also when my voice dropped, yeah, people expect that to yeah. be coming from, <laughs> you know, six four two fifty, and it's mm-hmm. not within that frame. Um, yeah, I definitely. And I've seen the internet, you know, have their little conversations about it as, you know, it's, it's something, it's very interesting for me to watch because it's, you know, we've been, the internet has gotten very trendy in even the way it polices people and their bodies. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of that is, is fairly unhealthy. Um, and like I said before, I'm your brother. I'm that dude from down the block. Mm-hmm. I love the averageness that is myself because I can speak to the averageness and everybody else and validate that as well. Um, it just so happens that, you know, when you kind of root yourself in, in self and, you know, that, that kind of, that confidence that comes with self-acceptance, you can appear a lot bigger, apparently. <laughs> you can appear a lot bigger, uh, but that's hopefully what I can, I can impart to people because now, you know, I mean, it's weird. We talk about mental health and body positivity and it feels like we're simultaneously doing that and deconstructing it at the same time Mm -hmm. the work that we do on one side of the spectrum is people saying we need to have more grace and you know be better with people and and give them room to be themselves especially with things they can't control but then the others we then compare them at the same time and say that they are deficient for not having it um, and that's where for me, you know, I don't reside a lot on the internet for that reason, because there's this cognitive dissonance that happens. It seems like we can't stay on narrative. Um, and for me, the best way to do that is not to have an argument or to argue with people online, it's to show it to you, is to be real and authentic and, you know, not to spill a whole bunch of tea, but a lot of people, when you Google their height, they're lying. I was gonna say I'm gonna tell you straight up I'm five nine look at pictures of me next to people and see what they say they are and that doesn't make sense um but I think it's rooted in that you know it's rooted mm-hmm. in this pressure to do that and I think my career and you know my life is a testament to being okay and existing at the average of black experience and that that can be a beautiful uh thing um, so yeah, if you want to put that to bed, I'm five now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you know what? And on that note, um, we appreciate you so very much for not only doing this interview today, 
but for being the characters that you are, for being somebody that we all can connect with. Like mm-hmm. you said, the brother, the friend, the mate, the everything. Thank you for being that. Thank you for being conscious of the roles you take and how it will affect people. Um, despite whatever, you know, that check might look like, you know, we appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm seeing Dr. Tyler Jane Williams in the future. <laughs> I promise you, I don't know when, I don't know where, but it's coming. Um, just uh, make sure I'm at that ceremony, but I, I will. appreciate you. And if there's anything out there that you want the people to know about you, um, about some of the works that you're doing, some of the things you have coming up, you know, go ahead and let us know. Um, I mean, I would love to take this time to reciprocate that same energy. Um, I'm very specific about what I do, um, who I talk to. Uh, We're not, you know, you don't see me everywhere on purpose because Mm -hmm. I don't like doing fluff. I don't like just being in front of people for no reason. Um, I followed your page for years and I followed it because I feel that you guys are part of the conversation that is needed. Um, And I think for me, all I really want people to get, whether it's career wise or anything, I'm not doing promo for stuff just to do promo for stuff. Black men exist. We need to be validated in that and be validated in our full spectrum as men, as gentlemen, as as strong, emotionally intelligent and viable contributors to society. And I love what your platform does with that and the people that you choose to speak to and the way that you choose to shoot them, the way that you choose to develop their the content around them, the ones you choose to uplift. And that was why it was so important for me to carve out time to talk to you guys, because I think that's important and we don't have enough of that. So if there's an average black man in your life somewhere, Tell them that you love him today. Tell them that you see him today. Tell them that you believe in him today. Tell them that you you love his best self. That nothing mm-hmm. less than his best self is 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 going to be acceptable, and that you value that, and that you can you can sit there and like really validate and appreciate him for being beautiful, because we don't say that enough about black men. We're, you're not. We could be fine. You know what I mean. <laughs> we could be sexy, <laughs> but there's a difference between being desired and being appreciated. Ooh. We've been romanticized and been desired, but uh, you talk to black men over and over and over again. People want to obtain them, but they don't want to have them. And we can feel right that. There. We can feel the difference. You know what I mean? We've been hypersexualized by all of it. Let a black man know you appreciate him today. And I appreciate the fact that your page and your, your platform does that. Thank you. And I appreciate you. We appreciate you. The world appreciates you. And we're excited to see what you have coming up. So this is, I think, interview number two. We have a long way to go. We know you got a long way to go. So I'm sure we'll be interviewing you again for your next piece of greatness. Whenever you would like to.